This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Good evening, Tampa Bay. My name is Robert Harriman, and welcome to the show. And today we're going to do a uh, kind of a special show. I'm going to feature interviews on four different nematode or roundworm parasites with all of them with Rosemary Drizdell, a uh, special guest to the show. So I hope you enjoy it. The first half we'll be talking Ascaris lumbricoides and the whipworm. Now, Ascaris lumbricoides is also known as the giant intestinal roundworm, and it causes an intestinal infection called Ascariasis. And it's part of the family of parasites known as the soil transmitted helminths. Well, joining me now is Rosemary Drizdell. Rosemary is the author of the book, Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest. She also teaches clinical parasitology and writes about parasites from Nova Scotia, Canada. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Um, Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. I appreciate you doing this. Um, and before we get into the specifics, uh, let's start with a general overview of this intestinal roundworm. Well, Ascaris lumbicoides is one of the most common intestinal worms in the world. It is a sort of uniquely human parasite. There are between 800 million to over a billion people currently infected with the worm, so that could be close to one in seven people. But that doesn't mean that every seventh person walking down the sidewalk beside you has these intestinal roundworms because they are fairly concentrated in the less developed countries and the tropical or subtropical areas of the world. Estimates for the United States, well, we're not really sure because they don't keep close track of it. In 1987, around 20 years ago, it was thought there were perhaps 200,000 people in the United States that were infected with Ascaris, but there could be more now, there could be less. Sanitation makes a big difference in the number of people. Yeah, and um, who are the people at the most risk for this infection? Because you kind of talked about geography and the large numbers. Yeah, that's right. People living wherever there's poor sanitation would be most at risk. It is a parasite that is potentially capable of infecting people pretty much anywhere in the world. But of course, those areas with poor sanitation are generally in the warmer parts, like I said, in the tropical or subtropical parts of the world. And children are probably the most commonly infected, and that's simply because they're more likely to be putting their dirty hands, their fingers, or toys, or other objects in their mouths, and therefore swallowing the eggs of the worm. Now, how does somebody contract this parasite? It's a soil-transmitted helminth, as you mentioned. So it is by eating the eggs that are found in the soil. So the soil has to be contaminated with human feces. People who are infected will pass the eggs in their stool. And if somebody then comes along perhaps two weeks to 18 days later and accidentally ingests those eggs, then they can end up with the worm living in the intestine. And uh, can you describe the life cycle of Ascaris? Sure. If we start with the ingestion of that egg, so you swallow the egg and it ends up in your small intestine and that's where it hatches. A larva emerges from the egg and it immediately starts to do a tissue migration phase. So it penetrates the lining of the intestine. It travels by the bloodstream to your liver and then to your lungs. This is a tiny, tiny microscope. It will break out through the lining of the lungs and eventually get coughed up and swallowed, so back into the stomach again. And if that larva is mature enough, then when it reaches the small intestine, it's capable of maturing into an adult worm. There are both males and females. The whole thing takes a couple of months before we have mature adults who are capable of producing these eggs then that are passed in the stool. So in order to have infective eggs passed in the stool, you need both male and female worms present in the intestine. 
Now, as the nickname says, uh, the giant intestinal roundworm, it's, it's a pretty big parasite. Um, can you discuss for the audience the size and the appearance of the adult Ascaris? Sure. These worms can be impressively large. The books have the females uh, topping out at about one and a half feet, although I personally haven't seen one that big. They're usually closer to maybe 10 inches to a foot in length when we see them in the lab. Males are a little smaller, which is typical of the nematode parasites, and they can be up to a foot, but again, usually when we see them, usually a little smaller, maybe six to eight inches. And, and it kind of looks like an earthworm, it actually. It looks very like a large earthworm. They don't have the same sort of movement as an earthworm. If you've ever seen an earthworm crawling around, it tends to have a sort of directional movement. It's going from A to B, whereas the Ascaris worms, they don't. They just kind of wriggle and writhe. They don't seem to really have a directional type of, of movement when they're at least outside the human body. Gotcha. It is pretty easy to tell an adult Ascaris from an earthworm, and sometimes there is a question, you know, if people find a worm perhaps on the floor or in the toilet and they're not quite sure where it came from, so it's important to be able to tell the difference. And the adult Ascaris tend to be smoother, they don't have that kind of segmented look to them, and interestingly, most people probably don't know this, but earthworms have little tufts of hair on them, which Ascaris don't. Well, I learned something today. <laughs> okay, let, let, let's get a word from our sponsor. Uh, for many years, we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com, or email them at info at glymedx.com. All right, Rosemary, um, how does somebody diagnose this parasite in a human infection? Well, these worms are pretty famous for wandering around. And so sometimes it's pretty obvious the patient may pass a large worm, it might wriggle its way out while you're in the bath, or it might come out your mouth or your nose. Sometimes people find them on their pillows in the morning when they wake up. And when the worm appears like that, it's pretty easy. It's a pretty easy diagnosis because very, very few other things would look like that with that kind of a story behind them. But we also, as I mentioned, we can identify them in the lab, the adult worms, by putting them under a dissecting microscope and looking for smaller features. And we also often discover an Ascaris infection by looking at a stool specimen that's been submitted to the lab for ova and parasites. These worms produce a lot of eggs. For instance, the female can produce and, and release about 200,000 eggs a day. So it's usually pretty easy to find an egg in a stool specimen if they are there. Now, Ascaris is treatable, I take it. Yes, it is. There are several drugs that will work for Ascaris. I think albendazole is probably the one that's being most commonly used, at least in developed countries right now. Quite easy to uh, treat an Ascaris infection. Yeah, I, I remember uh, when I was studying parasol parasitology many years ago, um, the professor was talking about the treatment of Ascaris during certain times, and there would be a condition called erratic Ascariasis. Are you familiar with that? I'm not sure what exactly your professor would have been talking about, but there are a couple of un unfortunate things that Ascaris can do. As I mentioned, they sometimes come out the nose or the mouth, so they have the females in particular seem to have a predilection for wandering around a little bit, and sometimes they'll go up the common bile duct into the liver, into the pancreas, or, or even break through the intestinal lining into the abdominal cavity, so these would certainly be unusual cases of Ascariasis. Perhaps that's what he was referring to. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's the parasite was trying to flee from the drugs or, or something to that effect. Yeah, apparently certain drugs, not necessarily the parasitic drugs, but other drugs that where patients may be being treated for something else, will, will stir up the worms and cause them to go wandering. 
Gotcha. But the explanation for the wandering that I've read that makes the most sense to me is that when you have an infection and there are only females present, they may be looking for a male. If you see the, the males when they come into the lab, their tail is curled up, sort of coiled around, and the female worm apparently sort of slides into that little coil. So this may be why she likes to go up tubes like the common bile doctor, that sort of thing. I see. Now, with such a massive worm burden uh, worldwide, uh, what are global health authorities doing in the area of prevention and control of this parasite? This is one of the ones that's called a neglected tropical disease, and that is because where it is mostly present in the, in the tropical areas of the world, there hasn't tended to be a great deal of attention devoted to it. However, in recent years, there is more attention, and there are a number of programs. The World Health Organization is certainly pushing for the mass drug programs where they target children and women of childbearing age, and they will give everybody in a community a drug, perhaps albendazole or mabendazole. These drugs are often donated. So they'll go in once or twice a year and just treat everybody, assuming that most people are infected. In some places, 70 or 80 percent of children will be infected with ascaris. So and whether they go in once or twice is often determined by what the prevalence of the infection in the community is. So if it's lower, maybe once a year. If it's higher, twice a year. Trying to simply cut down on the, the number of people that are infected and thereby try and break the life cycle of the parasite a little bit. One of the things that makes it very difficult to treat Ascaris is that the eggs of the worm are extremely resistant to harsh conditions, including chemicals, and they can live for a long time in the soil, perhaps as long as 10 years or even longer. So even if you were capable of wiping out the infection for everybody in the community, it's going to come back because people are going to be exposed to those eggs that remain viable in the environment. Um, Rosemary, um, I didn't ask you about the pathology in humans. What can you tell us about um, the disease process in a human being? For many people who only perhaps swallow a few eggs, there won't be any symptoms whatsoever. They may never know they have this parasite. So it's people who actually swallow a lot of eggs or are continually exposed to the eggs where we see the problems. If you swallow a lot of eggs at once, then those larvae, as they're migrating through your tissues and especially through your lungs, can cause a, a pneumonia-type syndrome, which actually can do a lot of damage to the lungs and is sometimes fatal, but that would be an unusual case. In children and in adults, but mostly in children, when you have a large number of worms in the intestine, they can have a bloated appearance and they can get intestinal obstruction from the worms kind of tying themselves in knots. Damage due to migration of worms, as we've already mentioned, occurs sometimes. And in children as well, over the long term with chronic infection, there's a more insidious uh, set of symptoms where they simply don't grow as fast. They may grow up to be smaller than they ordinarily would. Their physical fitness may be poor, and also they have poor performance in school. Now, you are the author of a book about human parasites. You're a lifelong student and teacher of parasitology. Do you have any interesting historical or personal stories concerning this parasite? Well, I have two little things. One which I think is really neat is that they think that that when humans domesticated pigs, this was sort of the beginning of where the incidence of Ascaris increased, and it could be that we caught it from the pigs, but it could also be that we already had it and gave it to the pigs. <laughs> and today, this is evolution as we're watching it happen. The pig parasite and the human parasite are very, very similar. They're morphologically indistinguishable from each other in the lab. And it seems quite obvious that people sometimes get the pig one and pigs sometimes get the human one. So we're not really sure which way it went. So I think that's fascinating, and I'd love to yeah. 
to try and figure out which way, which way that went originally so long ago. But the other thing that's more interesting in most recent years is you probably remember that they found King Richard III of England in 2012. He was buried under a parking lot in Leicester, England. And an analysis of the soil in his pelvic area turned up Asker's eggs. Not viable after all the, all these years, of course, but recognizable as Asker's eggs. Which sort of levels the playing field, doesn't it? Even, ro- even royalty back in those days had these intestinal parasites because, of course, there was very poor sanitation. So pretty much everybody, even in England, even in the northern countries, pretty much everyone had Asker's. Yeah, I got a little short uh, story to share myself. It's actually a personal story. In the mid '80s, I was living in the Philippines, and I was working in the microbiology lab there. And I was fresh out of school, and I remember they brought in this patient who had a lot of bleeding issues, and I had to go up and draw her blood one time. I was—I'm giving away my age here. I—I <laughs> I, I was about 22 at the time, uh-huh. and uh, I remember going up there to draw her blood, and. A worm came out of her nose. Oh yeah! And and here I am, 22 years old. That just totally freaked me out. <laughs> but the unfortunate uh, end to this story was she went through so many units of blood, trying you know trying to solve the problem, and she had this massive bolus of Ascaris mm. uh, worms in her intestine. And the I was at the Air Force base there, and as you know, uh, as a active diplomacy, they would occasionally take local nationals in to treat them in hard cases. Mm -hmm. And they stabilized her, and she left the base, and a day or so later, she did pass away. Uh So they didn't didn't totally solve it. But yeah, so just to... You know, not every 22-year-old goes through that. <laughs> yeah, no, it is obviously very disconcerting for the patient as well as anyone else oh, who's course. around if if a worm decides to emerge from a spot like that. I've heard of the very tiny, the very young, immature worms even crawling up the lacrimal duct and so coming out through the corner of the eye, which would be oh, wow. pretty disconcerting as well. Yeah. yeah. All right, Rosemary, let me uh, close with this. Do you have any final thoughts on Ascaris? Anything you'd like to share? Well, just that we're not going to we're not going to get rid of Ascaris anytime soon because as I mentioned it's so resistant in the environment and it's so hard to um, help people who live in those places where it's common because it's connected with poverty and so not only do you have to try and raise their standard of living but you also can't clean up the environment so Ascaris is is going to be with us for a while. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Rosemary, for your time and expertise, and I'll see you again very soon. Oh, thank you very much for your interest. And, uh, of course, my special expert guest is parasitology teacher and author of Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and how are you today? Just great. Thanks, Robert. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk whip- whipworm. Um, what is whipworm? Whipworm is an intestinal worm that inhabits the large intestine, which sort of sets it apart from some of the others that generally tend to live in the small intestine. So it has that territory pretty much to itself. It's a pretty tiny worm, very thread-like and perhaps three to five centimeters long, called whipworm, its common name, because it has a whip-like appearance. It actually has a very fine, uh, thin end and then a rather fat end, like the handle of a whip. Interestingly, it's the thin end of the worm that is the head. Now, how common is whipworm infection globally? Estimates are that perhaps 600 to 800 million people are infected with the worm, most of them in the tropics. This is considered a oil transmitted helminth, much like Ascaris and much like hookworm. That's correct, and those three worms often sort of travel together, so sometimes they are also referred to as the unholy trinity. Yeah, well, when, when I was working in the Philippines in a, a parasitology lab, uh, we used to see these three together all the time, and yes. we called it the terrible threes. The terrible threes, Yeah, that was yes. our name. Um, so how is whipworm spread, Rosemary? 
Well, it's spread when human feces are, when they contaminate the ground. So in places where there's poor sanitation and you come in contact with feces in the soil, that's where we come in contact with whipworm. You eat the egg, which is the same way that the giant intestinal roundworm, Ascaris, is transmitted. So you eat the egg that's been perhaps in the soil for a couple of weeks in warm, moist, shady conditions. Now, can you talk a little bit about the life cycle of uh, whipworm? Yes. When you swallow the egg, the, the egg hatches, and the larvae then invade the intestinal tissue. They can wander around a little bit, and those that are located in the large intestine over a period of about three months will mature to adults. They're interesting in that that very thin, the head end of the worm remains threaded into the tissue while the big fat end hangs out into the lumen of the intestine and eventually will start producing eggs, which are then passed in the stool and the whole life cycle can continue and go around again. Now, who is most at risk for the infection? It's most common in the tropics, although it is a fairly hardy worm and can handle some colder temperatures. Of course, people who live in poverty and who have poor sanitation, like the other two of the unholy trinity, are the people most at risk of infection with Dracurus. Okay, let me break for a second um, for a word from our friends over at Global Lyme Diagnostics. For many years, we have been waiting for our Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com or email at info at glimedx.com. Uh, Rosemary, uh, what are the signs and symptoms and the pathology of uh, whipworm infection? It's one of the less serious worm infections in general. You can have perhaps up to 100 worms and have no symptoms at all, provided that you're in fairly good physical health. Infections that involve worms greater than that can involve, uh, cause diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, anemia, and particularly in children, we see poor growth, poor development, and poor performance in school. If you have a really heavy infection of Tracurus, it can cause rectal prolapse, where the, where the rectum kind of turns itself inside out and protrudes out through the anus, and some of the worst textbook pictures are of that sort of event. Yeah. I Quite bet, disturbing. Yeah. Actually, I have seen that live, and it is mm. quite a scary sight. Mm-hmm. Um, Rosemary, how is whipworm diagnosed? We look for the eggs in stool. They're very characteristic. They're often described as looking like a tea tray, so an oval tray with two handles, one on each end. They're not handles, of course. They're little plugs that are a feature of the egg, but they're very characteristic and quite unlike anything else that we see in the stool sample. Mm -hmm. And how, how do people, what can they do to prevent this infection? Of course, washing your hands after you use the washroom or come in contact with anything that might be fecally contaminated, washing uh, fruits and vegetables before you eat them, and in general, avoiding contaminating the soil with feces. Yeah. Now, I take it the treatment is probably very similar to its related nematodes? It is. Those drugs we're so familiar with, mabendazole and albendazole, are the recommended anti-helminths for them, and they're quite effective. Okay. And I always like coming to you for this last question about each parasite, uh, because I read your book and I really enjoyed it. Um, Any interesting stories about whipworm? Well, the most famous whipworms ever were probably those of Otzi the Iceman. Some people will be familiar with this fellow who emerged out of a glacier in 1991 around the border between Austria and Italy. He lived over 5,300 years ago and was in that glacier for most of that time. 
and they've extensively studied the remains of this fellow. There's, he's now in a museum somewhere in Italy, and we've learned a lot about what the life of those people was like at that time. And interestingly, he had whipworm. They found the eggs in his intestinal contents. And what's particularly interesting to me is that they didn't seem to find any others. So no unholy trinity for him. He just had his whipworm. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, mm-hmm. I want to thank you once again, Rosemary Drisdell, for your time and your vast expertise. I appreciate it. My pleasure, as always. Okay. Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Robert Harriman. Well, welcome back to the program. Before we get into the next interviews, uh, I just want to give you a little information that uh, back in the 80s, I was working in a parasitology lab in the Philippines. The first two parasites you heard in the first half, and the next one we're going to be talking about, the hookworm, is something we saw on a very frequent basis, and all three of them together. We used to call them the terrible threes. We used to see them quite frequently in local nationals that were applying for food service jobs on the air base over in Clark. It was very, very common that we would see dozens and dozens of, of potential employees to either a base facility for food or the local Burger King or whatever that had all three there's all three of these parasites and these are all soil transmitted helminths they're all roundworms that are found in the soil and um, so anyway that's kind of the backstory behind those three parasites that I have a long history with and the last interview about the pinworm and this is I don't know the most common uh, human roundworm in the U.S., and we see this quite frequently. I just thought we would share that with you, too, since many of you, especially parents, are quite familiar with the pinworm. So we'll go ahead and start out with hookworm and then pinworm, and then we'll close out the show. Today we've covered several different types of parasites on the podcast, protozoa, tapeworms, and roundworms. Now, on today's episode of Parasites 101 on the podcast, we'll be looking at another soil-transmitted helminth, the hookworms. Joining me, as always, to answer some questions about the hookworm is parasitology teacher and author of Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest, Rosemary Drisdell. Hi, Rosemary. How are you doing this evening? Great, Robert. Glad to be back. Okay. Now... Hookworm is not a genus and a species, but a generic name for this group of nematodes. Rosemary, what are the hookworms? Hookworms are little round worms. They're quite small, maybe about a quarter to a half an inch in length, so visible to the naked eye, but you might not notice them. And the reason we call them hookworms is because there are several different species that infect humans, so it's kind of a catch-all name to refer to all of them at once. Now, unlike the other soil-transmitted helminths, like Ascariasis that we talked about earlier, um, in which humans become infected when ingesting uh, infected eggs, um, this is not the same story for hookworm, is it? No, it's not. The hookworms actually infect people by penetrating the skin. So if your skin comes in contact with the larvae that are present in the soil, they'll penetrate the skin and they do a little tissue migration, eventually ending up in the lungs. They get coughed up and swallowed, and from there they go to the small intestine and develop to adult worms. So it's a little different life cycle than the things that we get by swallowing them. And because it is skin penetration, is this more a disease of children than adults? or? Well, children are certainly um, more heavily infected, yes, and uh, may suffer more serious consequences of the disease. But really, anywhere where hookworm is endemic and human skin comes in contact with the soil, uh, mainly the tropics, even adults will easily become infected with hookworms. So it's not mostly a disease of children, no. Okay. Now, this is generally considered a disease of poverty. 
How much hookworm infection is reported annually worldwide, and what areas are most heavily affected? Well, as I mentioned, hookworm is a parasite of the tropics, and we do see perhaps 700 million or more people infected in tropical areas. It is a parasite that's very sensitive to extremes of temperature, so if it gets too hot or too cold or too dry or too wet, hookworm simply dies. It can't survive. So that's why we see most people who are infected live in the tropics. Now, um, there was a report out recently uh, where there was a study in Alabama, and they found hookworm infection um, in several dozen cases down there. And yes. It, and, and it surprised uh, the researchers. Um, Rosemary, can you talk briefly about the situation in Loundis County, Alabama? My understanding of that situation is that the people in that county have uh, proper sanitation. They have toilets, but these toilets don't necessarily go into a, a sanitary sewage system, so they may discharge onto the ground. And even though that's perhaps at some distance from their dwellings, you know, things do get spread around. Earthworms and animals and weather and water and all these things can spread things. So if if... The eggs are present in feces that are then deposited on the ground and then larva hatch. It's still quite possible for people to come in contact with those larvae. And it may have surprised a lot of people that this was still around in Alabama after all these years, but it doesn't particularly surprise me because anywhere where there isn't a really good sewage system and feces can end up on the ground exposed to the air, you can get hookworm having quite a successful time infecting people. Now, hookworm uh, can be relatively asymptomatic with low, low burden infections, but it can cause a lot of pathology too. Rosemary, what are the signs and symptoms of hookworm? Yeah, there's a difference between hookworm infection and hookworm disease. So if you have a low number of the worms, you may not even know they're there. But if there are a lot of them, the major symptoms of hookworm disease are simply anemia because the worms attach to the lining of the intestine and they literally suck blood. So if you have a lot of worms, that can cause quite a profound blood and protein loss for for the person. So your symptoms are going to be things like Iron deficiency, anemia, listlessness, pale skin, protein deficiency, sometimes a rather enlarged, rounded belly, which is a symptom of protein deficiency. So that's what hookworm will do over the, over the long term. Now, can you talk about the diagnosis and treatment of hookworm? Of course, if you have typical symptoms and you know that hookworm is endemic in an area, you may have a high level of suspicion just from the symptoms. But also, we can prove that hookworm is there by checking stool samples and looking for the characteristic eggs of the worm. It's quite easily treated, treated with albendazole or mebendazole, both very readily available low-cost drugs. So it's relatively easy to treat if you know it's there. Now, since hookworm larva penetrate the skin. Uh, prevention must entail minimizing the exposure of skin to the soil. Yes, and you would think that even just preventing that would be quite effective, but of course in tropical countries it's difficult to limit skin exposure to the soil. And so just doing that much, we used to think that providing everybody with shoes would protect them, but that wasn't terribly effective. Really, the most effective thing is to prevent uh, contamination of the environment with human feces. That is the key to breaking the life cycle of hookworm, but even that is very difficult in some parts of the world. Now, in several countries, the government gives deworming medication to school children as prophylaxis without being diagnosed for hookworm. Uh, how does this work? That's right. Generally, the thought is that if you have a prevalence that exceeds about 50% in a population, you can go ahead and treat everybody without proving, you know, which individuals have it and which do not, because at that high prevalence, you know, everybody is pretty much going to be exposed. So that's what they generally do in those situations. Now, other than that, in countries where hookworm is prevalent, um, what public health actions are taken to prevent the population from getting infected? 
Yeah, again, often large-scale deworming programs. So the drugs that treat hookworm will also be effective against the other soil-transmitted helminths, especially Ascaris and Trichurus. Mm -hmm. So if you do a large-scale deworming program, you can lower the levels of infection for all of those uh, intestinal worms at once. Of course, there are efforts at increasing sanitation. And really, as you mentioned, it is a disease of poverty. So raising the economic status of the population is very effective as well. Um, now to close, uh, Rosemary, what unique or strange tale do you have today about hookworm? Uh, there are so many to choose from. One could write a whole book about hookworm. Can't imagine but, that. <laughs> yeah. But what I find particularly interesting is that Fossil human feces in North America have been found to contain hookworm eggs, and these predate the European colonization, so they're pre-Columbian. Now, the theory has been that people migrated to North America across the Bering Land Bridge, so a bridge of land that connected Alaska and Siberia. But because it is so sensitive to extremes of environment, hookworm couldn't have survived that journey. So the presence of hookworm eggs, fossilized hookworm eggs predating the Columbian era, tells us that there must have been another route, something quicker and warmer in order for hookworm to have come to North America. It's very intriguing. Yes, it is. All right. Well, you, you got me stumped again. Um, thank you again, Rosemary Drizdell, for another very informative interview. I appreciate it, ma'am. Always my pleasure. Thank you. For many years, we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test... Recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X dot com, or email them at info at glymedx dot com. Today we're going to look at the most common nematode infection in the, in the United States. The pinworm, also known as the threadworm, Enterobius vermicularis. Joining me to shed some light on this common parasite is friend to the show, Rosemary Drizdell. Rosemary is a parasitology teacher and author of the book, Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest. Hello, Rosemary, and thanks for spending this time with me once again. Hi, Robert. Thanks for asking me. Now, what is a pimworm? And, uh, can you describe the adult parasite morphology? Sure. A pinworm is a tiny worm, actually. You mentioned the, the giant intestinal worm, Ascaris lumbricoides. Pinworm is at the other end of the scale. It's about the size of an eyelash, only fatter, so very small. And that's the female. The male is even smaller than that and actually very difficult, just barely visible to see with the naked eye. It's called pinworm because the shape of the female at the tail end, she narrows to a very sharp looking little point. So she looks a bit like a pin. She is basically a tube of eggs. A female pinworm can contain between 10,000 and 11,000 eggs. And often if you look at her under a stereo microscope, you can't see any internal structure at all because she's just so full of these eggs. Now, we call it pinworm down here in the States. Uh, I hear the term threadworm used for it also. Is threadworm a Canadian or is it a UK um, name for the enterobius? I'm not sure, but like you, I typically hear the worm called pinworm. I think threadworm is confusing because it's sometimes confused with another worm, Trichurus trichiura. So uh, nowadays, I think people tend to stick with pinworm. Okay. Now, this is a pretty common parasitic infection, isn't it? It is a very common worm. Depending on who you listen to, it might be the most common intestinal nematode that infects people. Other people would say that Ascaris has that distinction, but I think it could very well be pinworm because it's present in all populations everywhere all over the globe. It has the 
advantage of being transmissible directly from person to person without having to spend any period of time in the environment, which means that it can pass from person to person in the Arctic, in the tropics, or anywhere in between. Now, what are the risk factors for pinworm, and how is it contracted? Anyone can catch it, although we do see it most commonly in children. Also in people who live closely together, say institutionalized people, or uh, also people with poor hygiene. And it really does boil down to poor hygiene and the ability of the worm to be transmitted directly from person to person. So unwashed hands, and, and of course we see that more commonly in children than in most other groups. You catch it by swallowing or inhaling the eggs that I mentioned. These eggs tend to be, they they can be airborne, but they also tend to be rather sticky and so they can adhere to surfaces such as taps and doorknobs and anything around the house really, clothing, bedding, towels, that kind of thing. So an environment can be quite heavily contaminated with pinworm eggs. I found one study where they looked at a school and they looked at pinworm eggs that were sort of stuck to the wall. In the hallway of the school, they found about 119 eggs in a square foot of hallway wall. In the classroom, 305. And astonishingly, in the washroom, 5,000 pinworm eggs in a square foot of wall. So that gives you an idea of just how heavily a building can be contaminated with pinworm eggs. One other number for you, 7.7 to 13.1 eggs per gram of dust. And so these are the ones that become airborne and then settle out with dust in the air. So they really could be anywhere and in quite surprisingly large numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, what about the life cycle? Is there anything unique about the life cycle of the pinworm? The pinworm has an interesting life cycle. The adults tend to live in the cecum, which is the very first part of the large intestine, or in you know the area around that in the large intestine or small intestine. And when the female is ready to deposit her eggs, she crawls out through the entire length of the large intestine, out through the anal opening onto the perianal skin, and there she basically explodes. So you get the all of those eggs being deposited there in that perianal area. And like I said, they're sticky. And they also cause some itching. So people tend to scratch, especially children. Again, they tend to scratch and they get the eggs on their hands and underneath their fingernails. And so after that, anything they touch can become contaminated with pinworm eggs. Those eggs are infective to another person almost immediately. So anybody that comes along and touches anything that the infected person has touched or perhaps makes the bed and maybe flips the sheets around a little bit and it makes the eggs become airborne, then they're likely to become infected with the pinworm as well. So uh, if somebody in a family has pinworm, it's very likely that everybody is infected. Now, you mentioned itching. Uh, Are there other symptoms that go along with pinworm? Itching is definitely the most common and the most infamous symptom. But we also see restlessness, particularly at night, because it's when you're asleep that the female worms tend to crawl out and explode and leave all those eggs. So sleeplessness, irritability, perhaps just from discomfort or from lack of sleep. It can be painful or kind of a tickly sensation. And of course, if you scratch a lot, you can damage the skin so that you sometimes get secondary bacterial skin infections. Abdominal pain has also been reported. And then we have the instances of worms that kind of go wandering. So they can get into the peritoneal cavity. They can wander outside and into the female genital system, sometimes around the urethra. So they can end up in all kinds of interesting places. The appendix is another place where we tend to see pinworms. And there has been a reported association between pinworm and appendicitis over the years, although it's not really clear whether the pinworm has anything to do with the appendicitis or whether it's just an incidental finding. Probably doesn't cause cause acute appendicitis, but may cause some inflammation in that area. And I should mention that many pinworm infections are asymptomatic, 
So you always have to be aware of that asymptomatic person who doesn't even know that they have the infection but could still be harboring it and spreading it to others. So how is the pinworm diagnosed? It's, it's a little bit different than diagnosis of other, uh, other parasites, right? It is. For most intestinal worms, we look for eggs in the stool or sometimes the worms themselves or segments of them. But for the pinworm, because of that life cycle where the female pinworm crawls outside and deposits the eggs outside, that's the best place to look for them. We do find them in stool samples at times, but the age-old specimen for diagnosing pinworm is simply a piece of scotch tape so you lay it over the perianal skin and then stick it to a slide and we can look at the slide under the microscope nowadays people in the laboratory aren't as keen on that kind of specimen because you can imagine when you're dealing with all those eggs it's very hard not to externally contaminate that slide so you could then end up with a laboratory acquired case of pinworm infection so it's, it's not our favorite. We like something like a, a Vaseline swab where you can get a little bit more distance from the eggs while you're collecting the specimen. But that is the key to get the specimen from that area and to identify the eggs and sometimes the adult worms as well. Now, the treatment, um, it's pretty easy to treat, right, Rosemary? Yes and no. The worm is susceptible to common uh, antiparasitic drugs that we use such as mebendazole, albendazole and parental pomoate however you've probably got the sense that it's not just the patient we need to worry about but also the environment so it can be quite difficult to eradicate enterobius in a family or in a building you have to try to clean up as much as possible, regular laundry, good hygiene, and often it's recommended that people are treated a second time, about two weeks after the first. This is because those eggs will remain viable for two to three weeks. So if you can clean up the area and then those eggs will start to die naturally and you treat the patient again, then you're more likely to be able to achieve uh, a real proper cleanup of the worm. Yeah, so there's, you mentioned there's issues of contaminating family members, and uh, just now you alluded to uh, issues of reinfection with pinworm. That's right. Yeah. It's very common to become reinfected because those eggs remain in the environment. And I have a quote for you from a paper. Cleaning a bathroom using a damp cloth with an antibacterial agent or bleach merely spreads viable eggs. So they're really not very sensitive to the antiseptic cleaners that we use, and they're very persistent in the environment of a home. Hmm. Um, all right, Rosemary, you got any interesting stories to tell us about pinworm? One thing that I find fascinating about pinworm is that there's long been a theory that it may carry a protozoan parasite called Diontomyba fragilis mm -hmm. within the actual eggs of the of the worm. And the reason that this is has been has been proposed is because it's known in some other species and it's not clear how the protozoan would get from person to person otherwise because it doesn't have a resistant environmental stage. So there hasn't really been proof of this, although there's been a suspicion for decades. Yes. And and recently researchers found that they could isolate the DNA of the protozoan from eggs that had been externally sterilized and cleaned, which is good, strong evidence that those worm eggs do harbor that protozoan and that it can be passed from person to person in that way. What I find really interesting to think about is it suggests that possibly the protozoan is a parasite of enterobius and was a parasite of enterobius before it became a parasite of humans. So perhaps we're an intermediate host or an accidental host of a protozoan that, that's actually a parasite of a parasite. Even parasites have their problems. Interesting theory. Yes. All right. Well, thanks again, Rosemary, for your time and expertise. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Well, I hope you uh, enjoy these four interviews. Um, and I want to thank... Rosemary Drizdell um, for her wealth of information and knowledge about parasites. So we've covered the giant intestinal roundworm, whipworm, hookworm, and pinworm on today's program. 
And I want to encourage you to check out more interviews with Rosemary on the podcast, Outbreak News Interviews. And that can be found on the website, outbreaknewstoday.com. Or you can find it on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and on Stitcher Radio. So we put out, uh, try to put out at least one Parasite interview per week. And we're doing a pretty good job at it. And she's been a fantastic guest and a supporter of the show. Anyway, so I want to go ahead and close now. And I want to thank you for listening today. And I will see you next week on Outbreak News this week. Good night. And God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman.